Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. With me, as usual, is Rob Hirschfeld. Good day, Mr. Rob. Stephen, hello. It's bright and shiny. It's bright and shiny. Our continuing way to say hello to each other. I think this is our 36th or 37th podcast. And, uh, you know, and a shame for us for not bringing on our guests sooner, but he was hard to get a hold of. Uh, Jordan Rinke is with us. And Jordan, welcome to the uh, podcast. Thank you, man. I'm excited to be here. You guys are doing a bunch of interesting stuff. Well, great. It's good to have you. And I know you just made a big job change. So why don't we just kind of real quick, give your background and then lead into where you're at now. And I think people would be excited to hear about what you're going to work on. Sure. Um, you know, I mean, I, I did a bunch of OpenStack stuff and then containers became, you know, the jam. And so I've been doing Kubernetes for a while and I uh, was working with Supergiant and just switched over to uh, working with Walmart now as a principal engineer over there, kind of helping build out the future of containers at massive Walmart scale. So we're kind of uh, trying to, I guess, pass that, or what I say is uh, cross that trough of despair before everybody else, because Walmart experiences all the problems first, really. Makes a lot of sense. And are you, yeah. so I was at SREcon, Steve and I were both at SREcon. Jet had a huge presence there too, um, with their own unique challenges. Are you, are you crossing over with the Jet and Walmart teams, or are they still... Yeah, so they're 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 being integrated right now, uh, and then the platform stuff that's built is really sort of trying to be designed as a universal platform for everything. Uh, the way that we're doing design is, you know, it's four stores, it's four uh, data centers, it's four public cloud, and and merging and managing all those things together, which is part of that whole trough of despair. A lot of people run a single big cluster, uh, but we're running, you know, every single size cluster possible, geo distributed. They all have to talk, they all share data. Some of them do. Um, and so integrating those those acquisitions is part of that. And, and you're, I mean, you've been a real open source person for the last, you know, since I've known you in the, in the early OpenStack days, you and I were, were I, I remember um, having a good time overindulging maybe whatever word you want at the Cactus Summit in Santa Clara. I was just back yeah. there having deja vu. Um, yeah, how does, I mean, does that, how does that fit, right? If you're talking about avoiding the trough and sharing this knowledge, that's, that sounds very open sourcey to me. Is that, is that, is that part of the story here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Walmart is, it's one of the things that brought me back, right? There's a, a big culture shift and a, a big change in focus there. Um, we're open sourcing tools, right? Walmart Labs has stuff that's out there that's open source now, and we're going to continue to do that. And that's one of the things when I came back is I was like, look, I'm not going to get lost in enterprise. I'm, I'm very public and I'm very open. Uh, and their, you know, their position on, on that was, we need that. We want more of that. Come here and do that and do it in the public and do it open and, you know, let's make this a, a better thing for everybody. And that's really what got me on board at Walmart. And so you'll see a lot of the stuff that we're working on right now uh, coming out in open source and, and talking about it publicly. And we're going to try to sort of lead that space, um, you know, and try to innovate. We'll see what happens. But it's a, a very big change for, for Walmart versus what I knew 10 years ago. Um, so I think it's going to be exciting. Wow. That's a really big deal. Um, yeah. So, so. Boy, at Supergiant, you were trying to do some really cool things with Kubernetes. Um, I'm interested to, to hear your take on sort of opportunities, challenges from that perspective. You know, um, let's start with tech, but we can talk vendor ecosystem too and sort of blend those things together as, as you want. Okay. Um, so, I mean, what do you, what do you want to know about? I guess lead me. So, lead me so I mean, so Kuber, I mean, you're, you're trying to run Kubernetes at a certain scale. You're trying to make it incredibly usable. Where do you think Kubernetes is in that journey? Oh, that's, that is a, a good question. Um, I think, I think it works really well, really well for two things right now, really large scale that's sort of all put together in one place. So um, single data center, massive deployments, and then also little test deployments. So it's, it's got this weird kind of gap where I don't think that it's really well built for a lot of medium sized stuff now. So when you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, you know, distributed, you know, geo distributed stuff that maybe is not, not very large, or if you're talking about uh, companies that are distributed, so like in Walmart's case, um, you know, having a lot of stores or, you know, multiple data centers that are all latency sensitive. I think that's where you get into some of the, the trouble with Kubernetes right now, uh, specifically like if you look at the Federation data plane, one of the open issues with it is that it's super network heavy, right? So Kubernetes wow. kind of 
kind of right now anticipates that you're in a top tier facility. It's sort of it's a, <laughs> kind of uh, totally yes, absolutely, absolutely. Right? So it, it's all about, to, I've yeah. yeah, I have five thousand nodes that I want to to run together, right? And um, I think right. that's all it does. It it does Minikube and it does Massive. Right. Yeah, and that that's an interesting challenge, right? There is a degree. This was the early complaint um, was that there was a degree of overhead in building a medium-sized cluster, something like Nomad or Swarm was much friendlier for that sort of intermediate experience. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, it feels like that should improve over time. Have you, have you weighed in on the installer wars? I know that Supergiant was trying to do something around, I believe Supergiant was trying to do something around this. Yeah, yeah, and, and Supergiant uh, did, it works pretty well. We have, you know, a, a baked in kind of thing. Um, you know, that's that's an interesting sort of thing because you have you have Cubicorn, you have QBADM, now you have Cube Spray with QBADM. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, there's just this crazy mix, and I I don't know that I honestly I don't know that you're going to see a clear winner anytime soon because everybody just has the ways they do it. Like, uh, you, you know, one of the things that we're we're going back and fixing it at, at Walmart is uh, they started this journey, you know, a year, year and a half ago, and, and the, a lot of those installers didn't work. So they have a lot of hand-rolled stuff that we're going back and saying, there's tools for this now. Let's let's replace this and use, yeah. use the ecosystem. I mean, if you look at, you know, I don't want to dwell on OpenStack, but this was a major um, uh, pain point in the OpenStack ecosystem was the in, in, installer sprawl and, and tool, you know, all that, that tools part under OpenStack that, that really sort of created friction um, in the yeah. ecosystem. Is there, is, is this just something that we have to deal with in, in open source platforms? I, I think so. The, I think the one advantage that you have right now is it looks like almost everything has standardized on using KubeADM as the base installer. So even uh, Heptio or, or Chris Nova's um, uh, Cubicorn uses KubeADM. Cubes right now uses KubeADM. Uh, Superchance moving towards using KubeADM. Like as, Our, as long as you ra the rack end crypt standard. stuff that we built used, we, we picked KubeADM, but it's really not an HA story. Right. Um, I guess, I guess Coop Spray can make it HA, but yeah. Yeah, it at least gives you the, the basic tenets and the TLS and, and it makes it has smart same defaults, which has really been a lot of the problem when you get into the installer wars is some of them throw a lot of that away to be easy. Um, that makes sense. But yeah, you know, this, we'll, we'll see how that shakes out. I mean, but fundamentally that doesn't address upgrade, you know, Kube ADM does not address the orchestration necessary to upgrade a cluster. Um, yeah, true. And, and that's going to require some external uh, stuff. Even, yep. even, you know, uh, Chris's concepts on, you know, intent-based computing uh, in Kubicorn, uh, I, I don't know how much that actually really does ongoing day two stuff. Um, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah, I, I, I agree. That's, it's one of the things we're looking at right now is, is how to do a CI CD pipelining for Kubernetes itself and then the actual rollout and deployment of those, which hopefully something that, that will open source as we kind of get a handle on it. But um, you're, you're right in the, uh, I just lost my train of thought. Yeah. It's such a big sort of thing that's going to be such an issue. Um, yeah, I'm interested to see the solves that come. It's although the jet stuff is Azure, right? Uh, yeah. So there is a, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting blend. It, it's another one of the reasons I went there is it's, it's Azure, it's OpenStack, it's VMware, it's bare metal. It's like anything that can possibly provide compute. <laughs> they, they run it in some way and it's all got to play nice now. So, so is, is there a special area of interest for you from that that perspective or use you, you know, devopsy automation provisioning sre what's the what, do you, what do you expect really, at what, what's your uh, hat? it's it's going to be that orchestration piece it's going to be the the big gap that sort of i think exists there and getting all of those small and medium-sized clusters to play nice and, and share data and then also create you know a managed platform that the thousands of developers can use in, in, in a regular way so it's going to be tooling and orchestration i think um, is really going to be the, the biggest benefit because the Kubernetes ecosystem is already solving most of the other problems. Um, this area, I think, is the, the part that's going to start being solved and, and we can be ahead of that. I think that's exciting. All right, there's, I, there was a time when CoreOS was 
making a lot of noise about containers and container, you know, using Kubernetes to bootstrap Kubernetes. Um, I haven't seen that coming up quite as much lately. Um, do you think that's a reasonable, reasonable approach? Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I think the, just the standard, I think installation has gotten easy enough that just standard bare metal rollouts are, are kind of the de facto standard. I also think that a lot of people sort of went away from the core OS models because the other OS has got enough, got to be lightweight enough um, that it didn't really provide massive advantages. I, I know that um, mm. uh, a lot of people have picked Ubuntu or, or, you know, RHEL and stuff just because they have all of their standard tools. So they can take Kubernetes and they can start putting it out on stuff that exists without having to change their whole paradigm. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the thing. CoreOS was was very cool very early, and they really pioneered the container space in that orchestration and administration. Um, I just don't know that they still provide enough advantage for people to want to make that big jump. I I had a theory. I'm interested in your opinion on this. Or actually, Greg Altaus, our CTO, had a theory. When Docker when Docker was was churning, I'll try and use the polite euphemisms. When they were okay. churning through a lot of versions. Um, Patching it and installing it in a standard operating system was a really painful process. And so having somebody do that and bake it into the operating system so you could get an AMI from Amazon and just boot it saved you a lot of heartburn. And with Docker not being quite as um, unpredictable, it's it, the need for that has, has decreased significantly, right? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And you also have the orchestration piece that was missing from that before, where now with Kubernetes managing the, the HA components of it, you know, you can throw a box away and just put a new one out and it'll, it'll reschedule on it, right? So you can have really disposable processes where before people were kind of running containers as um, somewhere between a container and a lightweight VM. So they were still running stuff that was an HA and that couldn't take that downtime. And, and now people have sort of adopted the appropriate architecture to, to be able to actually have that ephemeral hardware kind of thing going on. So ephemeral hardware, immutability, do you have a, can you define immutability for us? What do you, where's your stance on this as a comparison between Chef, Puppet, Salt, Ansible? Uh, so I think this is probably one of the places where I'm a, I'm a little bit more of an outlier. Um, you know, I definitely believe that you should be able to just sort of throw something away and, and replace it. Um, but I do still believe in maintaining it a little bit. So uh, it's, it's one of the things where like people uh, like to just drop all of their configuration in uh, user data or do an Ansible playbook, roll it out. And if they ever have a problem with it, just throw it away. Um, I, it just seems a little bit more efficient to me to actually go ahead and maintain configuration management on that, maintain drift. Uh, Cause you, you know, you get a lot more tracking out of that. You, have, you can actually troubleshoot stuff, do some customization, uh, you know, and if you have a problem, if you get to where you're actually troubleshooting, then throw it away. So I kind of like the, the middle area where you're, you, you are doing an immutable setup, but you're actually maintaining and managing it and monitoring it uh, and deciding when to throw it away instead of just doing it, doing it really aggressively. So instead um, of, instead yeah. of every, every change you have to do a rollout, you're thinking some of these things can be patched. Yep, That's absolutely. It. Yeah, and I think that's a, I think it's a blending of those, um, you know, but people have very different opinions on that, so. <laughs> that's why we ask. It's, it's not entirely clear cut. Um, I, I'll tell you, our, our opinion has been drifting towards immuta more immutability um, mm -hmm. because the, it's really much faster is sort of what we've, what we've been seeing. Um, well, it depends on your environment, though, so. Um, when you're looking at, you know, well, you guys, you guys work on a lot of bare metal. Um, yeah. We have some instances, or I've worked on some instances where reprovisioning certain things take a half hour or an hour, um, where instead I could have just rolled out a, a one minute patch, right? So, right. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. The the thing that that tipped us over was we started seeing um, the immutable deploys to metal um, are just outrageously fast. Um, yeah. they, they're still more than a minute, but um, the risk of a dependency graph problem on a machine, it seems pretty high as a problem. And so that's, that's a, 
I don't know. It's a balance. That's why it's fun to ask. Um, yeah. Where, with where that goes, especially on Windows. Windows is just painful, slow. Well, and that's that's the thing. I think that's where you, you see more of a blend too is in, in mixed environments where you may be deploying to another country or to an edge site where um, you're having to blow down a full image if you're doing an immutable install versus, you know, a 100 meg patch, right? So there's some stuff like that where you have to take considerations of, of what's actually available in terms of resources and bandwidth. That's a very good point. Yeah, that's true. Um, boy, there's some architectural, architectural int interesting things. So that, that sort of actually leads us into edge. We're just going to cover everything at lightning speed today. All right. uh, are you, are you tracking edge it infrastructure at the edge at all? Like store on premises type stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's one of the, the harder things to solve is uh, for the most part, almost all of Walmart's infrastructure is very well connected, but uh, because they really try to reach out into emerging markets, some of, some of the stuff out there is on 56 K. Some of it's less than that. Uh, it's really common for, you know, when you have, you know, 11 plus thousand sites, it's really common for fiber to be cut somewhere or cable to be down and be on satellite backup. <laughs> Daily or be on occurrence, site. right? Yeah. Yeah, ab literally. Absolutely. So um, the concept of, having a really malleable flexible edge for us is is a very real thing and so we have to design for something that works on literally dial up you know all the way to the you know the, the cross data center connections so um it's, so it's you, a problem not a lot of the people have can you define edge for us it's one of our favorite questions um for for us I mean, at least for my team Edge for me really is the stores. They're the the very furthest of, the furthest out that we will reach in anything, um, and that I think is is even more distributed than most people's typical edge. So, uh, where it would be edge of network for most people, ours is the actual physical endpoint location that then has forty or fifty systems running inside of it that that talk back and and some in isolation, some that talk back. So right. for me, our edge is the very last bit of physical presence that that we own and control makes a lot of sense and and then at that point the, the store it needs to be autonomous it needs to be able to have enough customization that it's it's you know every store is a little bit different every you know and, yep. and so and yet centralized because you don't you don't i'm assuming you don't have it pros managing the data centers on in the stores and the distribution points those are supposed to be relatively hands-off right yeah, and, it, and it's variable. That's the the other thing with with Walmart as a whole is there are so many different brands under that, so many different sizes of stores. Some of them do have on site staff, some of them don't. Right? You know, it's 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 that variability that creates the interesting problems. Wow, no, that's super exciting. Do you see any any so Kubernetes? I'm, I'm inferring Kubernetes down to the edge, right? You know, basically being able to run a whole store as a as a on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, which wow, that so that that would be a really interesting opportunity for Kubernetes to basically be a a, a universal uh, control plane for you. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's absolutely what we are working towards is the ability to use Kubernetes regardless of the size of infrastructure we're running, um, regardless of the connectivity. Uh, you know, and, and be able to use that same platform and system. Because there are certain things that are designed to where they run in the store and they run in the data center, just depending mm -hmm. on what their utilization is. So they might cache a bunch of stuff and run in the store when possible, but we're not there. So we have this mixed mode environment already. Um, and so being able to orchestrate that on top of Kubernetes and, and move that workload around is, is going to be really a game changer in, in how we manage infrastructure. Wow. So... I'm thinking, this, so you're describing something that, that to me is what everybody should be thinking about for cloud, or sorry, for edge and cloud as an interaction point. So what, what you're saying is I have local processing, high late, you know, low, bet, low latency, things that have to happen in the store. I need to be able to survive my internet being out so I can never depend on the cloud entirely. But if possible, I do offload to the cloud. I do send information up to the cloud coordinate, you know, you're coordinating inventory on a global basis. Um, and you're designing an application that literally can dynamically redistribute its, its compute capabilities, redistribute its data. Is that a fair 
assessment? Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely the goal. We'll we'll have to choose some things. We'll do that. Some things won't, depending on the size of the day and how you move it around replication. But um, that is absolutely something that we want to achieve: is the ability to decide where that workload lives based on cost, latency concerns, be able to really tune all those knobs that just aren't aren't tunable right now. So we've we've been discussing in in some other podcast episodes this idea of you know data that can follow you know, basically much more dynamic data locations. Is, mm -hmm. Do you see a, a framework or a tool? What's, I mean, it, that's really hard math. Um, is there, it's not, that's not, Kubernetes doesn't do any of that lifting for you. That's something you're, you're building. It's something you're looking for. Is that a fair? It, yeah, absolutely. It is. It's something that we're, we're doing both, both things right now. We're, we're always looking at what options are out there. Um, and we are building some of that stuff in right now. And, and that's where a lot of the selection on what applications go onto this platform now and how do they move around? How big is their data? Can we trim that out? Like, can some of the data be high latency and some of it be low latency and, and splitting that out? And, and what it really requires is you have to have a much more specific and intelligent design in your architecture. You can't just sort of make an application and put it out there. You really have to design it and its data and how it uses its data to be able to ad adapt and ad adopt this process. Yeah, that really creates a data, you know, it's not a simple data storage problem. There's a locality question and there's a connectivity question in the, in the data information. Um, yeah. This is, this is when we had uh, Del Dave Nelson with uh, the Redis Labs call, we, we hinted at this at the end. Um, if somebody's interested in, in jumping back into that. And it's, it's a really significant challenge to realize that depending on latency, connectivity, availability, cost, you might you know, jump things all over the, your infrastructure um, and you might wanna do it automatically. It's, it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, there are certain things out there that, that kind of have some sharding aspects that you can do, things like that. They're not really entirely developed for that, but I suspect that we will see more and more of that come out as time goes on where you have a single database layer that's presented, but you have actual like least cost routing and things like that behind the scenes that, that pick where the replication's happening and, um, you know, the caching of data and where it's sharded. And those, I, I, I believe that we will see much more intelligent data platforms come out as this problem with, with Kubernetes being able to be small, medium, and large starts to get solved, that's going to be in higher demand. I think it's, it's going to follow very quickly. Right. And I, I think that this, the medium scale Kubernetes is not, it's, not a, it's, it's actually a very surmountable problem. It's the medium application in some ways, right? It's, it's an Istio fabric in a medium, you know, it's a skills problem. I, I suspect Walmart's going to be able to create three node Kubernetes clusters or 10 node Kubernetes clusters pretty efficiently. Um, yeah. The, the, over, the overhead isn't, it's not like the, op I was just talking to somebody talk with, uh, keep going back to OpenStack as our shared history, but they were saying the minimum, you know, configuration they could sell for an OpenStack cluster was uh, yeah. 10 nodes because you had three control plane nodes required for redundancy and then seven, you know, you had a, some usable capacity and they couldn't inter intertwine. Right. Um, and so, you know, maybe, maybe there is a minimum footprint. That's at this point, 12 nodes is a blade frame, right? That's Azure's, um, Azure's, Azure Stack's uh, footprint, basically. Uh, yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's one of the things we, we saw a lot at Supergiant was a lot of that medium-sized stuff where folks are wanting to stand up three, four, five nodes, kind of get their application on it, grow into it. Um, and I think that is one of the benefits of Kubernetes is that you can run a smaller set like that pretty light. But like you said, it's a skills gap. Uh, and that's where the whole KCSP thing really comes in. Um, I think the Kubernetes certified service providers can really leverage that and, and help people get into that medium sized stuff and, and grow it appropriately and still be really cost effective. I think that that's something that a lot of other platforms haven't offered before. So you're, you're seeing Kubernetes as like, if you're running small and medium kube, if you're running more than, than mini kube, just use Google, right? Just use Amazon, just use Azure's uh, Kubernetes. That'll get you through the medium size um, on-premises. Is there a market for on-premises Kubernetes besides people who are running bigger? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there, there are a couple of different reasons for it. Some have really specific requirements they run on-prem. Um, some actually are doing it because they're 
they're just really afraid of leveraging a pre-built platform from lock-in, even though it's kind of the, the same sort of thing. Uh, they have some stuff that runs locally and some stuff that runs in the cloud. And so they want to actually do a full Kubernetes install on VMs. Um, I've also seen some really interesting mixed stuff where you may have some stuff that is not completely fault tolerant. And so you run Kubernetes on top of VMware VMs so that you can still live motion a VM so you can survive hardware failures in a slightly different way. So it's hmm. it's that that stepping stone kind of thing where they're moving towards it, but they're not completely there yet. And so the resilience, they need some resiliency that that doesn't come from those platforms that anticipate you being able to have architecture that fits the Kubernetes style. That makes sense. That's a, I, the idea of vMotioning a machine to keep your containers up is, is <laughs> it makes me a little sad inside, but I, I get it. Um, that's, that's the thing that we, you know, that's, that's the, that's the reality of the world we live in. Right. You know? Uh, yeah. I, I guess the, the idea, that's a lot of expensive infrastructure because you need a SAN and all sorts of things to do that. Yeah, but you're also looking at a lot of places that have already invested, right? They already have it. That's true. So if you have it, use it. I, I mean, well, we're talking to people who are cube to metal. Um, super easy with, you know, from our perspective, there's, there's not much value unless you're looking to be motion in your container uh, <laughs> from the rest of that stack um, from that perspective. So I, we do need to be careful about time. Um, wow, there's so much. Um, sounds like you, you know, one, congratulations on Walmart. It sounds like they are, they're in a good place and moving to a better one from that perspective. Um, and you're going to bring a lot of deep experience there. Uh, is there, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, wow, we covered, and we covered just about all of our normal topics. Um, Steven, is there something we didn't cover? No, I think we, we think we got a lot. I guess we can ask. So you you were in Canada, right, Jordan? And now you've come back to the States? That's correct. Yes, I am. I am uh, located just outside of uh, Walmart's headquarters in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas right now. So are you, are you prepared for the shock and not having snow anymore? Or uh... <laughs> I am 100% okay with that. <laughs> is, I tried to convince myself that I was okay with snow, but I'll be honest, I hated it. I hated it so much. That's... You're, you're giving me flashbacks to one of the most bizarre OpenStack moments of the whole bizarre OpenStack moment, which was the OpenStack bus. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do that again one day. We're gonna do it right. Oh, when well, you guys drove the bus from San Antonio <laughs> all the way out to California yeah. and stopped to visit people. Oh my god, I, I forgot about that. The OpenStack yeah. tour, the the love yeah. tour. Oh my that thing was, uh, well, it was a story. Yeah. So, so for people who, who are like, what are they talking about? Uh, Jordan, you were one of the instigators with this Rackspace uh, to launch the, the Cactus Summit. I think it was Cactus. Um, yeah, drove basically rented a, a van and, and drove uh, four or five people cross country, stopping at different meetups. Uh, to sort of launch launch one of the summits, it was it was a spectacular <laughs> event. <laughs> you know, you know what? We, we we got some good friends out of it. All right, I'll say that. <laughs> it was it was definitely an awesome thing. Oh, that is funny. Yeah. We enjoyed so that too. Let me let me wrap it because I know we have time constraint yeah. on this. So, Jordan, uh, thanks for joining. If people want to get a hold of you, uh, Twitter. What's the best way to keep track of what you're up to? Yeah, Twitter's probably the best, you know, just uh, at Jordan Rinky and uh, do everything publicly there for the most part. Great. I, All right. Well, hey, thanks for joining us and uh, best of luck on your new job. And, and we'll see some amazing things come out of Walmart Labs and we'll know exactly who was leading the charge. So yeah, uh, thanks again for stuff. joining. Thank you.